Hello everyone and welcome into this my into my first ever tutorial video of automation game. Uh, I've been receiving a lot of comments and requests and even uh, private chats on Discord requesting that uh, I should explain how, for example, the suspension work or how we can make a, a, a good engine, how we can tune a good engine. And uh, I've received actually two comments and two, sorry, not comments, two messages actually. Uh, suggesting that I make a tutorial about making a car, how to tune the suspension of it to make it work uh, in bmg.drive or you know explain how maybe the, aer the aerodynamics works and well I'm more than happy to do that I mean a lot of people are actually interested in automation game and I thought to myself well why not I should do that and I should explain it to everyone so they can have fun and uh, play the game explore their creations and of course have fun with it so in this video we will be uh, I'll be I'll be giving like a not not a quick tutorial no not a, not a quick one at all but I'm going to try and explain whatever I know about making cars in automation game because well I've made so many videos more than 750 videos so far so yeah you can check out my previous videos if you want to see what what did I do what did I what did I create in the past and I will be sure to create more in the future. So right now, let's start with it. So this is automation game, as you can see. Uh, it's the game. The game is still in, in production. It's not yet finished. It's been very, very long time, and it's been very, very long, a uh, long way since the game actually released for the first time. This is the Unreal version, which is the best so far. The graphics, the graphics, the option, everything is absolutely beautiful so far. So there, there are not not many options you can go with. I mean, the, the tutorial will just, you know, will just open a YouTube video for you, which is exporting to BeamNG, which is not, really, which is useless so far. The challenges, well, it's a very, very awesome thing. Which is, you can take on challenges like, for example, if you want to build like a car scenario or an engine scenario, like they will ask you, uh, for example, do a race buggy engine, the Oli Crisis, a K car engine, and so on. And it, it's rated from very easy to extremely hard. So yeah, it's really really fun when you get used to it. Now let's go to the sandbox mode so we so I can explain to you how we can build. Let's let's start with a simple car. Let's start with a simple car and start with the year with the, with the production year 2020 because it's the best. It will you, it will give you all the best numbers, measures, and everything. So what I'm doing here, or what I'm using here, is um, kilograms, not pounds. I'm using horsepower and not kilowatts. I'm using pound feet, not me newton meters, and I'm using US miles to the gallon, miles per gallon. Yeah, and I'm using also RON uh, octane rating, not AKI. So it's up to you. You can go to the settings and, of course, change the measures into your favorite um, measuring system, Imperial, Metric, whatever you want to use. All right, so let's try and build a simple car. So the year, the production year is 2020, as you can see. Uh, let's try and build a, I don't know, let's try build an all-around car. So let's pick this hatchback 2009 model. So it will, the game will open to you like this. It will give you like a chassis and four wheels and as you can see McPherson strut front suspension and double wishbone. Alright, don't care about that. So the first thing you need to decide is what kind of car you are actually designing. Are you designing an economical car? Are you designing a lightweight car? Or maybe are you designing a taxi or a police car? Or maybe a, a, a commuter car or a sports car or maybe a racing car? So you, have, so you should already decide what what kind of car you want to build with before you start doing anything because every every single option you will choose here it will affect the market it will affect the car it it will even affect the the car how, how the car will drive because well it it can be lighter heavier thirsty efficient powerful uh, low on power so yeah you need to decide before you start with anything else all right so now I'm gonna try and build. A basic city car, a car that can that can travel, that can drive in the city, that is efficient, with a little bit of sportiness. So it's like an all-purpose car. So let's start with the panel. The panels mean the panel material is the body materials, like the doors, the fenders, the hood, the trunk, or the bonnet. All these things are counted as panels. So you, you need to decide what kind of material you want to make those panels out of. So the easiest option is to use steel. Steel is a very very popular car making material but unfortunately it's extremely heavy. It's safe yeah but it's extremely heavy and, and it will rust. 
but the upside is it's uh, it's affordable it's cheap and it will not take any 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 yeah, I mean, any any manufacturer can design and make cars from steel. It's very very simple, and the engineering time is extremely low. So it's up to you what kind of material. So if I want to build a car in 2020, of course I don't want the car to rust. So you can choose steel, but it will rust. Or you can go with, as you can see, you can go with corrosion corrosion resisting steel, and, and it will give you like a comparison between both of them. So the the uh, corrosion resisting steel has a less tooling cost but the material itself is expensive as you can see check out the line the material cost the safety is the same yeah and the corrosion well it's look at look at the difference and still it has the same engineering time so it's a good option it's a little bit extra expensive but it will make your car rust proof and some some markets actually will not prefer that but you have to check your market or you have to go with your instincts like what kind of car you want to design a good car a bad car a cheap car so as i've mentioned before you need to decide and you know what, what kind of car you are building and there's also fiberglass which is extremely lightweight but not safe at all because well it's like plastic it's a fiberglass that's why it's rubbish it's extremely light if you are building like a really really light car a really light and cheap car fiberglass is your friend uh, aluminium it's a very very advanced material it's light it, it will not it will not it will not rust at all but it's a little bit expensive and it will require it's actually less safe as you can see yeah less safe than steel a little, a little bit less safe but it's a good a very very good material partial aluminium which is a mix up a mix between steel and aluminium so some panels will be made from steel some panels will be made from aluminium or aluminum whatever you want to call it and of course the most famous ever material which is the carbon fiber this is a very high-end material very expensive and takes a lot of time to be made and it's safe it's very very safe and it's very well, not very it's actually extremely lightweight so of course you already know what kind of what kind of cars you need to put carbon fiber panels on it well supercars like racing cars hypercars you know these kind of cars so since I'm making a car in 2020, let's go with our actually let's see partial aluminium or aluminum. I don't know because let's see. All right, so let's go with aluminium. Al aluminium, aluminum. It's a very very good material, and a lot of a lot of manufacturers these days designing their panels from aluminium or aluminum. Now the chassis itself. So you have these options. You have the ladder chassis, which is for like really really for real old old classic cars like really old school cars because ladder chassis are very very old school technology it's it, the engineering time is extremely low any any manufacturer can do it because it's simple it's the simplest option ever but it's extremely heavy i mean really really heavy the monocross which is the the most advanced option well it's not really super super advanced because the monocoque chassis is a is an old technology also but it's a very good option because if the ladder chassis that means you will have a separate chassis from the body i mean the body will be bolted on into the chassis itself but the monocoque the monocoque that means the body itself is the chassis you can't disassemble both uh, you can't dis disassemble them you need to weld them together as, as a one piece yeah so monocoque is very very safe it's much much less heavy and of course uh, it's not really cheap to make but it's very very uh, it's very very advanced these days i mean with 2020 production year it's it's awesome space frame chassis well this is for sports cars and s some manufacturers actually use the space frame chassis for uh, regular cars but it's very complex and the the car manufacturers or the car production will be extremely limited because they have to weld every single tube and they have to measure it and make sure that everything is perfect so it takes a lot of time to make this chassis but the good the, the advice the most amazing thing about this chassis chassis is if you are building a racing car or a sports car or, or even a track car this chassis will serve you like a dream it will never it will never flex it will be very very good around corners it will serve the, the purpose absolutely in an absolute beautiful way so yeah, if you are building a sports car, even a normal sports car, you can, you can choose it, but no mass production, as you can see, and it takes a lot of time to be produced. And well, you have to sacrifice a little safety because, well, it just it just uh, welded tube. So in in the case of crash, it will not be 
that much good to absorb the, the force, the crashing force, but yeah, it's not bad. The semi space frame chassis, which is a blend or a hybrid between monocoque and space frame. This is extremely good because and I love it I love it so much because it's made only from aluminium or aluminum. Yes, it takes a lot of time, the engineering time takes a, takes a while actually to be to be made, to be engineered, but it's very 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 good. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's safe. It's uh, it's mm, I mean the weight is in the middle. It's awesome. It's made from aluminium. It's light. It's perfect and the safety is good. So everything in it is good. And, and a lot of manufacturers these days use this, this this chassis because it serves as a normal car chassis it will be good it will be very tight and very and very good uh, in normal driving and also very good if you want to take the track uh, to, to take the car to the track so yeah if you're building like an all-purpose car if you want to build a, a normal car and a sports car at the same time this is your best chassis to go with if, especially when you want exporting it to beam and you drive because it will make the handling extremely good of course, and if you are building a pickup truck, this is also a modern pickup truck because in in the olden days, if you want to build, if you want to build a pickup truck, you just go with ladder. It will serve you absolutely, in an absolute beautiful way. But these days, it, to make the pickup truck more safe, more uh, more light, and well, more durable, the this is like a hybrid between ladder, as you can see, and monocoque. So we have you will have like the cab and the the cab and the and the engine bay it will be made from will be made by monocoque chassis as you can see monocoque chassis technology but the rear for the bed so you can put heavy loads you will have this beautiful ladder chassis back there so you can put heavy loads on it without worrying about bending the chassis or or you know damaging the chassis itself so it's a good option so since i'm making a a normal car i'm not going to make it really expensive i'm going to and i want i want a very a very fair engineering time so I'm gonna go with regular monocoque regular monocoque will serve the purpose the purpose very very well now the chassis material we have steel we already talked about steel and we have uh, galvanized steel well galvanized steel it's very very similar to treated steel they will take the chassis they will dip it in some sort of chemicals uh, like electronic uh, electronic shock the chemicals they will dip it in it and this way the chassis will not it will be like a little, a little rust proof they will give you like a guarantee a guarantee or a warranty for the car not to rust for maybe six seven years something like this and then after after the warranty finishes the car will just turn into a, a rusty a rusty box so it's a good option for people who wants to drive the car and get rid of it in six seven years and it's not really that that, that much as you can see, I mean, the only difference between those two is just the, the corrosion. I mean, yes, it wouldn't, it's not showing here, but in real life, as you can see, it, uh, it's, it's actually very good for a certain time. The best one is to go with, if you want, if you want to go with cheap steel, with, which is corrosion resisting steel. It will, be the, it will serve also a very, very good thing. It will be normal steel, but a little bit extra expensive and it will not rust at all because it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to make it this way as you can see uh, I'm not actually familiar with the with the with the way how, how can they do it I mean if you want to know, know about it you can pause the video right now and read what comes with the what is the corrosion resisting steel chassis material and well and the most modern option which is advanced high strength steel this is a very very good and very high grade uh, in, in safety steel it's it's lighter I think yes, it's lighter than the regular steel, as you can see, and it's much, it's much as you can see, much much. What is it? Much. Uh, it's not really safe. It's not really safe. Uh, yes, the the regular steel. It's not really safe, but the advanced high strength steel. It's a much high strength steel. It's really really hard, durable, and it can survive. It can take a lot of crashing force. So it's a good option. It's a little bit extra expensive. Takes a little engineering time. But it's good. This is the lightest. This this is a light, lighter option of the advanced high strength steel. But as you can see, it takes very very long time to be engineered, like 24 months. Yeah, that's a lot of time. Like it will take two years to be engineered to, to just use this material and the, you know to engineer the, to engineer this chassis, which is very very long. Glued aluminium, which is a very very special special material for like supercars and expensive cars because they will take 
just sheets of aluminium and then they will stick them together using a special adhesive and this adhesive is extremely expensive I mean it, this is a very very expensive chassis really expensive it, it will cost a lot of money and yeah it, I mean you, you cannot see it right now it, it says here the tooling cost the material cost is cheaper but now when you finish the car the total production uh, the total product production itself the price in total it will be very very expensive I mean look at it you can, you can pause the video right now and read what comes with it and of course the final option which is the carbon fiber monocoque chassis look at this beautiful date here carbon fiber magic this is also for supercars and hypercars and really really high end lightweight sports cars so since I'm making a normal car uh, the best option to go with you can go with corrosion resisting steel chassis like on the body and on the chassis your car will be cheap beautiful reliable and will serve the, serve the nation very well so I'm gonna go with those two materials to keep it affordable and cheap uh, the engine placement if you want your engine to be placed in a in a transverse way a transverse mean it's like you know those small compact uh, cars like Hyundai Toyota small ones the engine will be mounted like sideways this is what mean this is what transverse mean and longitudinal it's like um, in a long way like it's like it's like how how a V8 will be mounted how a V12 will mount like it, the face of the engine will face uh, will be like towards you like this it will not be tilted to the side so it's up to you and there are some differences as you can see in cooling capacity and the cabin volume itself because of course with front longitudinal the engine will take some space from the cabin for the gearbox for, for the gearbox tunnel to pass through the cabin but with the uh, with the transverse you, you don't have to worry about that because the gearbox will be in the engine bay so it's up to you my friend to choose whatever engine placement you want so since i'm making a tiny hatchback or a, or a normal hatchback i'm gonna go with transverse uh the front suspension well you have four options mcpherson strut as you can see, double wishbone and of course solid axle coil and solid axle leaves. The McPherson strut is a very very good option. It's light, it's it's cheap, and it serves as a sport. As it, can, it can serve a sports car, a comfortable car. It can serve every single car without any problem, and it will cost, I mean, really really nothing because not many parts can go wrong with it. As you can see, it's easy to make. It will not take that not that much engineering time. It's perfect. Double wishbone, it's more complicated because it uses more arms, more linkages, and more bushings. And the and the the spring itself, not the not spring, the shock itself design is just different. Uh, this 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 option here is very comfortable, and if you are building a sports car, it will be very very good around the track. But it will cost the company more to make it, and of course, it will take a longer longer time to be engineered properly. Uh, the solid axle coil, well this is for off-road machines, if you are building a, an off-roader, you want to have 4x4 and a front differential, this is your best option to go with. It, it can survive jumps, it can survive uh, very very high jumpy you know, off-road driving without any problem. And it, it, can, it can be comfortable actually, and it's extremely, extremely cheap. Uh, the solid axle uh, leaf, as you can see, which is the cheapest and the, basic, the most basic suspension design ever i mean it's just a solid as you can see solid front differential only two leaves uh, two shock absorbers and of course the the sway bar or the you know the roll bar as they call it that's it nothing else i mean there's nothing else to talk about here it's very very basic very simple and extremely extremely low on engineering time it's not really comfortable it's not comfortable actually at all but it can take extremely heavy loads so this is the best the best option to to put it on the rear suspension if you, if you are building a pickup truck. Moving on, so I'm gonna go with the Pearson strut because it's cheap, it's reliable, and it, it can be a very very good suspension. Now let's move on to the rear. You have the same options: solid axle coil, leaves, and we have semi trailing arms and we have torsion beams. Now since we are building a transverse engine placement, the only different option that you'll never find in any longitudinal mounted engine which is the torsion beam torsion beam is also extremely extremely basic for regular regular basic cars just a spring some sort of arms as you can see and a shock absorber it's extremely extremely basic and it's not really bad but it's rubbish i mean it's it will not be as comfortable as for example semi training arm or double wishbone i mean these things are 
very very like very very cushy and very very also sporty if you're if, you're, if they are tuned for sportiness so you have to choose whatever you accord according to your car that you are making what kind of car to if you are what kind of car will determine what kind of suspension to use multi-link which is even even more advanced than double wishbone because this is a very very complicated and complex suspension system that uses as you can see a lot of a lot of arms and bushings and things it's like it's like it's like if it was made in germany look look how many arm arms that are holding the wheel hub and look at this beautiful shock absorber and the spring in it just perfect and this construction as you can see bars down there just beautiful it's 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 it's, it's better than the double wishbone it's much more complicated it's it's much more comfortable it's much more sportiness it's beautiful and the final option for racing cars and hyper cars and, and even supercars which is the push rod suspension design which is the most expensive and the most complex and the the long the, the long the longer the longest of all of them to be to get engineered because the springs and the shocks will be will be mounted this way instead of instead of standing it will be it will be like mounted to the chassis itself which is facing the chassis itself which is awesome looks absolutely beautiful in a see-through glass actually in, in supercars and check out the bends and, and arms and, and the bushings and everything just complicated this is for racing cars supercars and very very advanced cars that that they are more more focused on the track so use your best option according to your car so since i'm making a regular hatchback i'm gonna go with semi trading arms because it can serve and it can be a very very good suspension for a front wheel drive car springs shock shock absorbers arms nothing special and of course a roll bar or a sway bar moving on so this is the now the chassis quality the chassis quality will the, the zero quality which is in the middle like it will it will be the best the best it is uh, as it is it, it, I mean in 2020 on zero quality it will be the best I mean the best you can have that's it but if you want to go even with with extremely more quality like if you want if you if you are, if you don't care about engineering time or maybe if you are designing a very very special uh, comfortable car or a very very special uh, handling car you can increase the quality by one or two or maybe three but more than three you will start to sacrifice engineering time and then your car will be very very expensive and it will start to get heavier because of more of, of the more material they will use in the chassis to make it better so my, my advice to you keep it on zero quality it will work perfect you don't need to increase it unless of course you are building really really something something special so on normal cars even on normal sports cars keep it on zero you don't need to increase it unless of course you are building a racing car that costs millions then then you can increase it uh, now this is the engine room so we can so now we will be designing our engine so of course the options are very simple you have inline engines v 60 degrees engine v 90 degrees and boxer engines the inlines where well, you have three three cylinders you have four and five and six of course the v engines the v6 degrees well you have v6 then a v8 and a v12 of course it's according you can use any engine you want but don't over engineer your car that and that means well for example right now we are designing a tiny car and you don't need to put a very big engine in it it's it's like it will be lightweight it will be good you don't need so much power in it some people love the power but you, you you can't just put like a 500 horsepower in it because well the customers will no one will buy it everyone will be scared of it and it will be not controllable at all so yes use your best judgment i mean yes you you can put a v12 in that hatchback you, you can put a v16 even but why it will be useless i mean it will cost very very it will cost too much and it will be really complex so yeah use your best judgment so for our car here as you can see we have 6 8 10 and it's 16 as you can see and the boxes of course you have the boxer 4 and the boxer 6 engine so my advice to you if you are building a hatchback keep it keep it in the inlines if you are if you are if you want to go with v with v engines stick with the v6 don't go over a v6 because then v8 v12 it will get heavier it will get more complex and you don't want to do that or you can go with the boxer engines because boxers are lightweight 
very very compact and they will they will be mounted very 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 low on the car which will give the car much much better handling but uh, they are a little bit extra complex to be made but you can make them because Subaru is actually making them I mean you can do that too why not so uh, let's start with something simple which is the inline four it's the most basic and the most recognized uh, the most known engine ever to, to humanity so let's stick with the inline four these are the materials well if you are building a regular cheap engine you can just keep it cast iron it's it's cheap it's easy the company will i mean any company will just any company can cast an engine it's really really easy uh, you can go with cast aluminium aluminium which will be as you can see look check out the weight difference i mean 37 kilograms for the iron and 25 for the uh, for the aluminium so use your best judgment there is also aluminium silicon and there is magnesium and of course the the the, the higher quality the, the material that means the more expensive so let's keep it simple cast iron block the bore and stroke my friend well this is a very important bit so pay attention the the bore will determine how big the piston is how, how big and how wide the piston is and of course the wider pistons that means the wider or the and the bigger the engine block itself as you can see so the bigger piston that means you yeah, will have you, you need a bigger engine block to take it so, so so this huge piston can go up and down in it as you can see so i mean basically for example a lot of hatchbacks these days use, 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 are using 1.6 liters 1.8 maybe 1.4 or you can go with a 2 liter engine so for example a good a good thing to start with which is the car not the car the the the, the best thing to ch to start with which which is the default the default settings which they are 86 on the millimeters on the bore and 86 millimeters on the bore and the stroke this way you will have a basic engine if you if you don't if you want if you don't want to miss with the capacity this is a basic a basic map that you can choose again the bore will determine how big the how big the piston is and how big the engine the block it is. The stroke will determine, as you can see, how long the connecting rods and how long the stroke. The stroke means the the the, the gap between the uh, yeah, between the piston and the as you can see the uh, what do, what do they call these the uh, I always forget the caps the the connecting rods caps yeah. So the, the, yeah, how long the connecting rod itself will be, how long the stroke, how long the stroke itself it will go up and down. So the higher, the higher, as you can see, the higher stroke, yes, it will increase the engine capacity, but it will not increase the block itself, the block size itself, as you can see. And of course, the, the higher, the higher the stroke, that means the less RPM you can actually rev the engine to the max, because when you, when you choose a very, very high stroke, I mean, your engine can barely rev to 5,000 RPM with the zero quality components. So, and of course, with extremely low stroke, that means your engine can rev extremely high to the moon, like 12,000 RPM and even more. So, if you if you do care about RPM, you need, you need to know what kind of stroke. And of course, you need to know that the more stroke, the more torque and the more horsepower you will have, because longer stroke means more torque, and more torque means, well. You already know you already know the answer the more torque the more power that means the better everything so you need to keep you know, keep you i mean you have to decide it yourself for example since i'm making a small hatchback let's choose something like 87 on the bore and a little higher stroke as you can see a higher stroke which is a 83.7 millimeters on the on the stroke so as you can see a higher stroke than the bore this way my engine will not rev high but it will it will produce a little extra torque and that's really really good what i want and the total way the total capacity is 1.6 liter or 1600 cc engine now the head and valves you have push rods which actually they are the lightest and of course the the easiest to make as you can see the easiest to make because it just the block itself will change because the camshaft will be here you will use push rods to push the valves to open in the in the uh, in the cylinder head to allow air and fuel to in, to go in and of course it will do the same thing for the exhaust valve to to allow the exhaust to flow out it's a very basic and simple design but it's very very outdated and very very old school 
and especially this one here in automation game because this is the, the classic one not the modern overhead valve system that's why it's it's rubbish i mean I, I never use it unless of course i'm making a really really terrible engine because it, the engine will 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 suffer from valve float it will not make that much horsepower i mean it will be rubbish and it's really really classic and old school i don't like it unless unless of course i'm designing an engine from the 70s 60s then yes it's a good option but in automation game in 2020 no direct acting overhead cam it's it's a it's a much 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 better option than the push rod but it's still also not really good it will it will, it will allow more air to flow in because i mean the camshaft itself will just touch the top as you can see of the of the valve cap as you can see and under it there is a spring and the spring will push the valve so it's a direct acting it will touch the head of the valve or the head of the valve cap like constantly which is much better than the push rods but it will not also allow for extra valves in the engine yes it will allow extra air but not really that much but it's a good option for cheap cars also the the next option which is the overhead cam which is a very very amazing option uh, it's cheap it's not really expensive and it will allow all the way to four valves per cylinder so you, instead of direct acting you, this is the camshaft as you can see you have a single camshaft where is it it's a mid in the middle and what you have here is these are like rocker arms so the the camshaft will spin it will spin this little wheel and it will push the rocker arm and this and it will push down the valve to open it and close it on all the valve and this technology will allow more air to go in and more air to go out and that means more power so you can add valves according to your engine like three valves per cylinder like two for the intake single for the exhaust or two for the intake two for the exhaust as you can see this, this is like the most good option you can have good air going in good air going out with a single only single camshaft that is really really good and really really compact it will get good horsepower good mileage good everything dual overhead camshaft that means you have dual camshaft, a camshaft for the intake only and a camshaft for the exhaust. And of course, when you're going to go with extra camshafts, extra valves, that means more work, more engineering, and of course, more expensive. So yeah, you need to use your best judgment to determine if your engine is a cheap engine or, a, or expensive high-grade engine. So it's up to you, my friend. Again, you can choose two valves. That means a single valve for, for the intake and a single valve for the exhaust. You can go with four valves, which means two by two, two for the intake and two for the exhaust. Or, because we have two separated or two camshafts, you can go actually with five valves per cylinder, and that means you have three valves for the intake and two valves for the, for the exhaust. And that means so much air can go in, like nothing can restrict the air from going into the engine, going into the combustion chamber. Chamber. So. That is the best option for racing engines, super high horsepower engines, and super high turbo turbocharged engines because nothing can stop air from going into the combustion chamber. So it's up to you, my friend. Use your best judgment and use what's best for your engine. So since I'm building a basic car, I'm going to go with overhead cam, single overhead cam, and four valves per cylinder. This way, it will still be cheap with extra valves to allow good air to go in, good air to go out. Let's close the head. So this this panel here or these buttons they will control like what kind of things you want to see in the engine. You can disassemble it. You can disable the airbox. But not now. I'm gonna tell you about this later on. Moving on now. The, now the cylinder head. The cylinder head. This this little this this metal piece on top. So you can choose it cast iron also. You can go with aluminium. You can go aluminium silicon if you want to make it extra. It's a lightweight. So since my engine is cast iron, it's a little bit heavy. I'm gonna go with aluminium cylinder head. This way, it will be a little lighter. And aluminium cylinder heads are very very popular these days. Moving on, uh, the VVL technology. VVL that means variable valve lift technology. That means you will have. That means you will have two separate separate uh, camshaft profiles. So I'm gonna choose it because it will make the engine much much more efficient and much more uh, better uh, along along the rpm range uh, if you want to make your engine cheaper you don't want to if, if you, don't, you don't want if you don't want to you know play with the camshaft and make your engine to look weird in, in, on the on the power graph you can go with none but a vvl is a very very good option let me show you 
So the crankshaft, since I'm building a regular engine, let's keep it cast iron because it can, it can rev to a good, good, a good amount of RPM. It will, be, it will serve the purpose. We don't need forged steel or billet steel because forged steel is for sports cars with high RPM and billet steel is for supercars and hypercars with very, very high RPM. Uh, connecting rods, the same thing. So cast iron or cast connecting rods will also rev to a normal RPM range. Not so high and not so low. Very good. Heavy duty cast. These are my, let me show you. Let me show it to you. Ah, oh, maybe not yet. All right, so the heavy duty cast, as you can see, this is normal cast, which they are thin, not bad looking, and they can rev normally. Heavy duty cast, they are heavier and thicker, but with heavier connecting rods, that means you can't rev the engine very high, but these connecting rods can survive under so much torque. They can take so much torque without exploding and, you know, and, and uh, shattering. But they are easy to make. They are not really expensive. If you if you want to if you want to rev the engine to a, not really high, like 4,000 RPM, for example, and if the engine is turbocharged and a lot of boost is going in, a lot of torque is going out, this is your best option. But but I, but I never use it because I mean I want to rev the hand, the engine. I'm not making a I'm not making a diesel engine, so I don't need this. Uh, heavy duty forged. These are for engines that wants to push that you want to push a lot of torque much much torque on them but they can rev high they can rev very very good actually they can survive very very good amount of torque lightweight forged they are absolutely the same idea from the heavy duty forged but they are lighter and they are thinner to allow very very high rpm uh, very very high uh, high rpm limit uh, but you know they will they will they can't take so much torque but they can actually you can rev them to the moon Lightweight titanium. This is the most expensive and the most and the best and the best option actually, which because the titanium is very very high and durable material. These are extremely lightweight, yes, and extremely durable against again you know with with with, uh, with very very much high amount of torque. So you can push the torque to the moon. You can you can slam the torque on the engine as high as you can and these connecting rods will just take it without any problem yeah but they are very very expensive so i'm gonna go with cast internal uh, cast connecting rods and now let's move on to, to the pistons so the pistons are have the same idea from the connecting rods the better the piston the lighter the higher it will rev but you need to keep in mind that some pistons will actually allow for less emissions and less uh, less engine noise for example Maybe we can't really see it right now. We need to finish the engine first. I'm gonna show you that at the end. But you can see the emissions here. So, cast regular cast pistons, as you can see, these are the emissions rating. Heavy duty cast, very very low RPM, much higher torque. Forged forged cast pistons or forged pistons. That means very high amount of torque, very high amount of horsepower, and very high amount of emissions. Hypercast pistons, that means normal RPM, normal torque, and very, very low emissions. If you are building like a clean engine, hyper, high, I don't know how to pronounce this, but I'm going to call it hypercast pistons. So these are your best option if you are building a clean engine. Low friction, low friction cast pistons, that means these pistons are very, 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 very soft on the sides. And that means no friction whatsoever or very, very low friction with the with the combustion chamber from with the engine block with the with the with the combustion or with the with the sleeve inside the inside the inside the, of course the, uh, the 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 combustion chamber so yeah these will not really rub alongside the walls of the of the of the cylinder head of the cylinder and that means better fuel mileage but high emissions so if you are if you are choosing between those two you need to sacrifice uh, fuel efficiency or if you want to sacrifice emissions, if you want to build a very very low, uh, if you want to build a very very high efficient engine, low uh, sorry lightweight forged pistons. These these pistons can rev extremely high. I mean, if you are building an engine with billet steel, lightweight titanium, and lightweight forged pistons, you can rev the engine to the moon. Whatever whatever max RPM uh, that was determined by of course the engine stroke. So they can rev to the moon. And since I'm building a regular city engine, I'm gonna go with hypercast pistons because these will give 
actually very very low emissions and emissions are very very important in California so if I want to sell the car in the California these are the best pistons to go with because the car will be very very low in emissions I want to build a clean car also not only an efficient car the quality well the best is of course it's a higher quality that means the the lighter weight they will become and the more expensive they will become and of course the, the higher engineering time and production units they will take so keep it on zero compression ratio the compression ratio means the the ratio between the or, or the gap between the top of the pistons and the valves so the higher compression that means the the closer the top of the pistons will come into those valves and the higher compression that means a very uh, a very very high uh, a very very high compression ratio in it that means the engine will get more efficient it will produce more power but you need but you need high grade amount of uh, octane fuel you, you need very very high amount of octane to run the engine without uh, without facing any knocking or detonating issues so a regular engine it can start from 9.0 to 1 I'm, I'm talking regular engines in 2018 and up it can start from 9.0 to 1 all the way to 10.5 to 1 more than 10.5 to 1 you need to you need to use like 95 octane fuel and up so yeah the engine will will get a, you know a little extra expensive to run so i like to keep it like 10.0 to 1 it's in the middle it's good it can be efficient it can be normal no problems whatsoever now the VVL profile. This is the the bit that I uh, that I was talking about. How to tune an engine with CAM profile and VVL. Well, the best option is to keep, as you can see, 20, 20 points gap between the CAM profile and the VVL. Always a twenty point gap. A twenty points gap is just the perfect. But when you finish when you finish making this engine, I will show you a, a good trick to to make your engine much much more efficient, ignoring this twenty. 20 uh, points gap so let's continue variable valve timing this is a good technology that will allow the cam gear as you can see to shift between profiles to allow for to, to, to change the timing and will, will allow the engine to run more efficient and produce good amount of torque on low rpm so it's a good option to go with unless of course you are building a cheap engine then go with none but I'm gonna go with it zero quality I don't want to make the engine expensive Turbocharged or an A? Let's go with turbocharged. So if you are building a turbocharged engine, you have two bearing options, journal and ball bearing. Journal it's the worst ever ever bearing option ever because it will make the turbo very hard, very hard to spool. It's rubbish. So don't use it unless unless you really really have to. Ball bearing will make the turbo with the ball the ball bearing is like small balls inside the bearing itself. Uh, that means that will make the turbo to spool much, much with much low, uh, which much low with much. Uh, what, what do they call it in English? Yeah, it, it will it will not take so much energy and so much air to move the turbo. This way, the turbo will will spool much, much early, and that means a better efficient, a more a higher efficient engine. So, use ball bearing when you can. Don't forget about the journal bearings. Intercooler, we, we will leave we will leave this for later. Now let's tune the turbocharger. Well, the easiest thing you can do, you can ju just go with fuel economy if you are building an efficient engine. It will work. It will work absolutely beautiful. If you are building a performance engine, you can go performance and of course race, go with race. But I hate those three. I, ha I hate those three. I'm not going to use them because, well, they are useless. But if you want a base map to go with, go with fuel economy. If you are building an econo economical engine, go with base econ economy and push the air ratio to the max. Push the turbine to the to the minimum, and you know, put it. Let's say put it not not in the middle, like below the middle a little bit. So the max is 61. I'm gonna use 40. Yeah, 40 is a good size turbo. The maximum boost. Let's keep it on eight. It's not bad. Zero quality. Now fuel system. Of course, you can use carburetor. You can use a carburetor, a classic single barrel one, which is. A very, very old school, not really efficient. You know, for classic 40s, 50s engines, single, single. Uh, where is it? Here we go. Yeah. So you know, single. Here we go. Single, single barrel carburetor. As you can see, it's not really bad. Yeah. But it's really, really 1950s, 1960s, and even 40s technology. So no, the single barrel carburetor. 
same thing as you can see but this is like eco carburetors they it, it will allow the engine to run on, on very very low fuel mixture yeah but it's very very old technology so two barrel carburetor as you can see it's a it's, it's a little bit more advanced carburetor to allow more air in it will allow more, the engine to run more efficient but still an old technology uh, four barrel carburetor which means it's a, a bigger carburetor it can make a good amount of power good amount of torque it, it can be efficient but it's still not really that much good vcoe which is a which is like a weber carburetor a, a, an, an italian design carburetor as you can see look at it it looks like an absolute beauty yeah look at it yes this this will allow very very high amount of horsepower very very high amount of torque but it's not really efficient if you are building like a high, a high performance carbureted engine this is your best option to go with performance race it's up to you now let's go to fuel injection so the first option you, you will face is the mechanical fuel injection that means uh, the engine is using a mechanical fuel pump to push pu push fuel into the engine the, the, the engine the pump is running on on the belt itself which is very 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 old and you know first early days in the fuel injection it's not bad it can work perfectly actually uh, but it's really really outdated you can use single throttle body or a throttle per cylinder that means you have how many cylinders we have four so you have four cylinder four throttles which is like good for high performance engines moving on what we have next is single point dfi that means that you have only a single a single fuel injector feeding all all the four Pistons, a single fuel injector. It's a very very cheap option and it's not really efficient. It's not really good on horsepower, but it's a very very cheap option if you are building a very very cheap engine. Uh, well, you have the multi-point EFI, which is the most common setup ever ever built on and on any uh, on any four-cylinder engine. This is extremely common on on any on any engine, Toyotas, Nissans, any small hatchback uses an EFI unless of course they are much much more you know expensive and they are using direct injection DFI we will talk about this later so the EFI uses the ECU to measure like the throttle position here and the how much air is going in like the uh, map sensor and you have four injectors you have a fuel, fuel rail a lot of uh, a lot of sensors here and there you have a calm calm positioning sensor and a crankshaft positioning sensor temperature sensor all these things just to determine how the engine will run yeah using using of course the EFI technology that means you have a computer inside the car inside the car controlling the engine which is which is very very efficient very good and it can allow for for very very good amount of horsepower till some point a throttle per cylinder uses the same technology which is a, thr a throttle yeah, so we have four throttles as you can see for per each cylinder and but still using the same injectors the same sensors a different intake as you can see and uh, the final option to go with which is dfi dfi is a is the most advanced and the most modern uh, option or fuel system you can ever use because it uses a the 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 injectors the fuel injectors the injectors themselves are not here are not on the intake manifold no they are on in on 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 the top of the pistons so the the injector will spray fuel into the uh, into the into the pistons directly the, the fuel will not run through the intake manifold no the fuel will get sprayed on top of the pist pistons in, in piston immediately like really like it's uh, directly no no running not whatsoever it will spray it will spray directly on the into the pistons which is the best and the most high efficient the most efficient way to use uh, the fuel injection ever it's the best it can good it produce very good amount of horsepower and very good amount of fuel efficiency so i'm gonna go with it it's a little bit expensive as you can see it's a little bit extra expensive but it's worth it the same thing you have throttle per cylinder or single throttle body for all the cylinders i'm gonna go with single you have standard intake manifold which is for regular cars <clears throat> that way that you want to keep them quiet the service low the service cost is low just go with you know go with the standard unless of course you want to build like a performance engine you can go with a performance intake manifold that means longer runners a little extra noisier intake <clears throat> and much more higher you know, power and torque race 
uses as you can see a carbon fiber intake manifold a, a much bigger throttle body and a more aggressive <clears throat> no filter uh, intake manifold that means the engine will suck in dirt and grims and everything the engine will not be reliable but it can it can make super amount of horsepower so it's up to you my friend i'm gonna go with standard now the fuel i will try and run the engine on 91 octane fuel so the engine can run in any country on earth tuning it here so let's start with the base map like let's start with 13.2 this is your this is the base map so so you so you can make your engine to run 13.2 decrease the ignition to 20 set it to 6000 and well since since we are building a turbocharged engine the only option we have here is short cost so the short cost is this is the only option for turbo but if we are building an na engine natural aspirated engine that means no turbocharger you have a a cast log a, uh, and also you have a short cast headers, tubular, long tubular, and race. Well, the better the, the the better the header, that means the higher horsepower you can make and the louder the engine it will get. So my advice to you: keep it in the cast log, or if you are building a performance engine, go with tubular. Yeah, unless of course you are building a super high performance engine, then you can go with long or race tubulars. Moving on, single exhaust pipe, of course. Let's start two and a half inch. Exhaust diameter or 63.5 catalytic converters. Well, these these catalytic converters can actually reduce the emissions of the engine so much. So in 2018, I think you need to have a catalytic converter on every car. So two-way is is the basic catalytic converter. It will it will actually reduce the emissions, but it will restrict the exhaust system so much. A three-way catalytic converter it will allow more air to escape. And it will make the exhaust much much more cleaner but it's a little bit extra expensive high flow three-way which is like for sports cars supercars or even hypercars it will allow super high amount of air to pass through and it will keep the exhaust also super clean but it's the most expensive one here 200 and where is it where's the, what's the material cost 132 dollars I think uh, the three-way is 95 and the two-way is 57 so you see what kind of price I'm gonna go with the three-way uh, the first muffler because I want to keep the engine quiet I'm gonna go with the burst flow this this is the this is the quietest muffler and a straight through so I can allow good amount of air to escape all right so now our engine is running perfectly as you can see and we are using only 84 octane and we are using actually 91 so we have a lot of headroom left the engine is making 20.5% fuel efficiency, which is very, very high. The engine is very, very quiet because it's less than 28 points. Any engine less than 28 points, it's a very, very quiet engine. Reliability is very high. The engine is light. It, it, it won't take that much time. Perfect. All right, now let's start tweaking our VVL. Let's see. Let's see what kind of target of horsepower. So I want I want to target 150 horsepower. And now, if you want to tweak your your cam profile to make your engine much much more efficient, pay attention to this bit here. Keep degreasing keep degreasing the cam profile till you hit the sweet spot, which is here. All right, here we go. 27. All right, here we go. Perfect. 58 all right so 27 58 yes there is a bit of a gap it's like 29 points but this way the engine is more much more efficient this way much better now this the engine is running a, little, a very very efficient very good amount of low rpm torque but there's a gap here look at this bump here this bump is caused by the gap between cam and vvl profiles don't worry about it let's move on to the turbocharger We've already decreased the uh, the, uh, the R ratio to the max, but as you can see, increasing the turbine will actually will not make any extra horsepower, and it will make the turbo less efficient. So let's try and decrease the R ratio to the to this point. Here we go, 1.31. This way, we did we didn't lose any horsepower. It's still 150, but the engine the turbo will will kick in much much earlier. Now let's check the uh, the compressor. 
all right less if you want if you are focusing on making your engine efficient you can just make it like this you can just decrease it till you hit the sweet spot you can also decrease it till you hit the sweet spot but you will lose so much horsepower i mean look at it automation says this is the optimal option to go with which is 23.8 but 105 horsepower that's rubbish i'm not gonna sacrifice so much horsepower so 147 horsepower all right don't worry we will get to 150. now the intercooler so it says here the intercooler can support the 364 horsepower but it's, it's a lie actually because look at it if i decrease it to 341 i will actually lose a horsepower decrease it more you lose you lose even more so if i want to put it if i want to put the intercooler to 140 horsepower i will only have 123 that's rubbish so find the optimal option which is let's say 280 and let's increase the boost a little bit just a little bit here we go 9.54 now what we have to do here is a very very important thing because we need to increase the ignition to allow uh, for more advanced ignition and more and more much more much more efficient engine so let's see how much we can actually kick the ignition before we run in on into troubles. All right, here we go. 24.2 on 67, perfect. All right, let's run it on, here we go, 62, decreasing the AP ratio. Here we go. Here we go, a little extra boost, and we have 24.8, as you can see. Perfect. The exhaust system. No, we don't have, we don't have to, to rush it more. It's perfect. All right, the engine is running perfect right now. It's making 24.8% uh, percent fuel efficiency. It's very, very reliable. It's, it's, it's producing nearly 160 horsepower. Let's try and push the 160 horsepower. 60, here we go. There we go. 160 horsepower as you can see and 165 pound feet of torque. So as you can see we have a 1.6 liter engine making 160 horsepower, 165, 165 pound feet of torque, 24.7 fuel efficiency. This is very healthy, no green, no, no yellow lights or red lights here. This is a flow bench, this is like how much air is passing through. So the exhaust is a little bit restrictive, the compressor is very restrictive, the intake is restricting a little bit. But don't worry about these. No one cares about these. Uh, unless, of course, the, the exhaust is, is orange or red. That means you have to increase the exhaust size. But it's perfect this way. So let's fire our engine and see how it will actually sound. So as you can see, I've actually pushed this button here to, to see what's inside the engine. And then I'll push the turbo, push the header button so I can see the headers and fire up the engine. So the engine is making 93 pound feet of torque at idle. Very good. Alright, the engine is running very good, but I think there is a little more in it because check out the pistons. The pistons can, can rev to 7300. So let's try and rev the engine a little higher. So let's say 7,000. All right, 7,000 RPM. This way, the, the power will peak at 6,700, 6, and we have extra 300 RPM of, you know, red, red range, which no one cares about. Perfect this way. I know that there is like a little bump here and it's smooth here that it will bump up because of the VVL profile but trust me for a for a regular economical engine it's just this thing is just the money really so actually you can increase the the cam profile a little bit to 64 and we'll have the power will peak a little later 6700 still the same 
or 6800 it's much better this way and yes 26 do the same this way we have 24 24.8 perfect now let's see what should we do let's increase the exhaust size so if we increase it to put 2.8 inch the engine will start to knock so that means we need to reduce the, the ignition timing a little bit so now we have 170 horsepower and the power is peaking at 6900 perfect now I increase the boost a little bit Mm, not much good actually so increase the exhaust a little bit still below 28 points perfect I like we increase the ignition 24.7 we are back at 24.7 it's okay but now we have 173 horsepower and 165 pound feet of torque from, from the same engine Beautiful. Now the engine is ready. Let's move on to our car. So this is the chassis that we have made. Now we need to choose what, what, what kind of body we have. So we have sedan, wagon, hatchback, coupe. So let's choose a hatchback. Unfortunately, there are. Here we go. No, no. fortunately, there are, there are some four door hatchback. Okay. So now we have a four door hatchback. I will. Let me let me just I will make it and I will continue this video. All right, so we are back with our car. As you can see, I finished all the fixtures, the headlight, the grills, the front lip, the wipers, the window washers, the side mirrors, the the handles, the fuel filler cap, tail lights, roof antenna, exhaust, rims. Yeah, fair, you know, normal quick details that I, that I did on this car and I called it the Virage because I have a Virage badge and I stuck it on it. Alright, so, well, uh, we have chosen the body and you can choose the color here, you can create your own color, you can, you can press the create custom color and then you can adjust it according to your own taste. So, let's see what kind of color fits on this little beast here, this beautiful gray rim love or yellow, black, or red, or even blue. Yeah, so let's go to this for example, and uh, they can, you can choose a color for your rims, chromies, carbon fiber, steel, same color. You can choose a trim, trim for example, plastic, there you go, perfect. I've chosen the fixture, as you can see how you have grills, vents, headlights, taillights, so it's it, it's up to you, it's up to your taste, my friend. Now let's move on. So we have finished the car, so we have finished the car, and now we choose what kind of drive type. So because our engine is transverse, it will be mounted transversely, that means you have only two options, front wheel drive or all wheel drive. So I'm gonna go front wheel drive. This is our engine, as you can see, this 1.6 liter engine is sitting happy and comfortable. This is the gearbox, perfect, front wheel drive. And then the gearbox, you can choose classic, classic automatics, that classic automatic gearbox, that means it will control, it will control the shifts uh, in a mechanical way, not, 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 not by using any, any sort of computer or any sort of ECU. The advanced automatic, that means the gearbox will be controlled by the ECU. The ECU will tell the, the, the transmission when to shift. Or manual gearbox, that means you have to use the clutch and you need to shift it manually. Sequential, that means you, you also have a clutch but only for the first gear and then you have to shift everything else uh, you know, without using any sort of clutch. It's good for, for a track car but it's not really good for the road. Dual clutch, 
uh, it's it's half half it's manual and it's automatic at the same time so you can shift it manually using the the shifters on the steering wheel or you can just put it in auto automatic and just leave it to shift on its own so it's up to you so since this is a city car i'm gonna and also a little a little sporty car i'm gonna go with manual manual the gearbox because it's the lightest and it's it will i mean it will, it will survive a lot of a lot of you know it, 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 it's more reliable than the automatic or sequential or even dual clutch and uh, let's see yes you have to change the clutch if you actually don't know how to drive it but it's still simpler and much much cheaper so six speed gear, gear, gear ratios it's up to you you can choose any ratios you want the more ratios uh, the more gears you have to control and the more, the more adjustment you need to do for the spacing to to find your sweet spot for the acceleration and the top speed and the fuel efficiency so uh, my, my, suggestion, my, my suggestions to you keep it on 5 or 6 for manual unless of course if you are building a classic car then you can go with 4 or 5 if you are building a dual clutch you can, you can go with 6 or 7 the same goes for a sequential automatic gearbox well you can go from from wherever all the way to 9 speeds yes because in automatic you can choose 9 speed if you want but it, it's not really good I don't like it so ratios here we go six speed now pay attention because it says here the estimated top speed is 217 so the first map or the first basic thing you can do which is set your top speed close to it so it says 217 you can go 219 for example this is just a stop don't worry about it spacing keep it on 54 now now differentials our engine is a little extra torquey it's not bad in horsepower 170 horsepower so and an open differential which is the basic and the cheapest here that means the, the front differential or any differential if you are building a rear wheel drive car you will have a rear differential if you are building an all wheel drive car or a 4x4 car you will have two differentials so this option is for any any sort of differential on the car so the open differential that means when you when you go around the corner and you push the push the the pedal or the fuel or the, or the gas pedal or whatever you want to call it the open differential will not really will not make the both both tires to spin together at the same time it will spin only the the tire with the with the less grip the tire with with the with more grip it will not spin it will it will to just rotate normally but the tire with less grip it will it will spin and that's not really good for cornering or acceleration so it's it's cheap and it's reliable because well there's nothing can wrong can go wrong with it but it's not really good for handling and for sporty car manual locker that means it's 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 an open differential but you need you can you can manually lock it and then it will spin both tires this is not for the track this is for only off-road cars for 4 x 4 so if you are stuck in a mud or some in a mud pit or something you can lock it before uh, before before going in or if you are already stuck you can just push a button it, it will lock the differential and then you will have the both tires spinning at the same speed which will help you get grip automatic locker that means the, the differential it will lock itself automatically it's not really good because it's not really predictable it can uh, when you when you need it to lock it will not be locked when you need it to be unlocked it will be locked so it's against your it's against your uh, your decision that's me that, that's why it's bad gear limited slip differential that that's the that's the easiest that's the other easy that's actually i think the best gear limit slip differential for normal cars because it uses gears to lock both tires it's a little bit more complicated because it's uh, it's mechanically controlled and it's it will lock both both rims at the same time uh, when you when you need it and it will be like an open differential on when you want when you are in a in a car park or you know, driving the car on slow speed so it's really really good it's the good it's the best limited it's the best differential you can go with for let's say more than 165 horsepower yeah it's good to have a, a locked differential vicious limited slip differential uh, it's it's a good difference it's, it's not bad actually but it's actually it's not really reliable because it uses a fluid instead of gears and mechanical things and it. it uses a fluid and when this when this fluid heats up it will lock the the tires together it's good but if the, if the fluid is cold you will have an open differential and uh, it, it, it can it can overheat quickly so it's not really a good option but it's extremely cheap and it can do actually 
uh, a good job limiting uh, limited, limiting the slip on the tires. Electric limited slip differential, it's the most expensive one here. It uses electrics and sensors and shafts and you know whatever 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 magic it uses electronically to lock those tires together. It's more expensive. It works perfectly, but it's super super expensive, and it's only for supercars, hypercars, and really really good handling cars with high with high price tag. So I'm gonna go with late gear limited slip differential. Moving on, radial tires, radial because these are the modern tires. Cross ply tires, these are like 1950s, 40s tires, something like this. These like, there's like a tube in them, they are rubbish. But the radial, these are these are our modern tires. Chunky off roads, where these are for off roaders, for off road cars. Hard long life tires, where these are the normal tires. Everyone uses them. Medium compound tires, these are the same, the same. Uh, hard this, the same normal tires but they are a little extra soft a little a little bit softer than the regular than the regular tires and they can provide more grip and this way because they are a little extra soft they are more comfortable sport tires as you can see these are a grippy softy tires they they, they will not last uh, as hard as those but they can provide very very good amount of grip and they are a little bit expensive Semi-slick tires, well, these are for the track, for track cars and for supercars and hypercars. These, these tires are super sticky and they are for track use. So I'm going to go with medium, medium compound tires. They can serve, they can, they can live long and they can actually be extra comfortable and extra grippy. Tire size, well, um, since this is a front wheel drive car, let's, I'm going to try and put like 200 at the front. Let's say 200 at the back. This is like a a base map yeah, to see what happens. To see what will happen. Rim material. It's up to you. You can choose alloy, magnesium, carbon fiber steel. I'm gonna go with alloy. Uh, tire size 640. Rim size. Keep it 17. Uh, let's keep it 615. Okay. Moving on. Brakes. You have single shoe drum, double shoe drum. And you have a solid disc. Let's see, you have a solid disc. You have a ventilated disc. You have a carbon ceramic disc for you know, carbon carbon brakes. These are super light and super super efficient. I'm gonna go with ventilated. Two pistons. 300 millimeters. I'm gonna go with solid single piston. 285 millimeters. Let's keep it on 50. I will adjust this later. Moving on. Now the under tray. Under tray means what the plastic that covers under the engine. It will provide. It will make the car more slippery. It will make it more efficient because the air will just slip by. It will not just hit the engine block or hit these exposed components. So none. Well, nothing. It's the cheapest. Off-road skid tray. Well, this is for off-road cars. There will be like a metal part down there in case you hit a rock or something. You will not damage the engine oil pan or the radiator. Semi-clad. That means you will have like a small plastic cover here at the front. Would provide a little slip, slip, uh, air slip. But yeah, it's it's good, but it's not really efficient. It's not really that efficient. Fully clad. That means everything will be covered down there. All the all, everything will be just covered to allow the air to escape easily un underneath the car. Downforce. It these the same. These uh, all the, all these. All this coverage down down there, they will be specially molded and specially made to make the car not only slippery, to also to provide grip also for you know sports cars and racing cars. So let's go with something cheap, which is semi-clad. Active rear wing. Well, if you have a rear wing, you can choose it, but well, we don't have that. Cooling flaps. Well, that means there will be a flaps, plastic flaps here and there on the on the grills. They will open and close according to the engine temperature. For example, if the engine is cold, they will close to make the engine to heat quickly. In the winter, and if the engine is getting warmer, they will open to allow air to escape in. And when you are driving and the engine is running, for example, normally doesn't need that much cooling, they will close and this way the car will be more slippery and more efficient. But you will have extra things that can go wrong. Sensors, motors, no. 
keep everything normal brake airflow 100 to allow the brakes to cool down the engine the engine can be can be cooled on 50 this is this is this is like normal the engine will be cooled normally this way it will be cooled enough but 55 this way it, it will allow more air to cool the engine this way it will be more reliable it will not overheat now the seat arrangement you have like two seats a small bench, small two seats, no seats at all. So a bench in the rear, two seats at the front. Standard, standard interior, standard entertainment system. If you want to read what comes with the standard package, you can pause the video now. And now, to read them, and the entertainment also, you can pause the video now to read them. Moving on, power steering. Well, we have to use power steering, so I'm gonna go with. Since this car is normally made, I'm gonna go with variable hydraulic. Yeah, you have like hydraulic, hydraulic, you have like a power steering pump. Yes, it will take some power of the engine, but it's cheaper. It's a little bit heavier, but it's cheap this way. And it's variable, that means uh, when you go, when you go on, a, with a, on a high speed, when you go and drive quickly, the steering will be less soft and more safe this way. Electronic stability control, so the car is stable in case of uh, in case the car is you know, spinning out or something. And um, let's see what we have here. Standard standard safety. Now the springs. You have regular chief springs. Progressive. That means a little bit harder springs. Hydromatic springs. These are for luxurious cars. Really, really comfortable and expensive cars like like Rolls Royces, for example. Because check out the material cost. The standard cost $18. This one cost $49. The Hydromatic $871. Yes, that's how expensive it is. The uh, Active Sport $622. The Active Comfort, the same thing. So I'm going to go with standard. Yeah, these are very, very expensive. So I'm going to go with Gaz. One or two. Semi active, now passive. Two and two. This is, that will be much, much cheaper. Very, very cheap this way. So the car is already good, as you can see, everything is good on it, it's a fun car, customers are loving it, but no. So since we are since we are happy with our tire size is 200-200, let's go and set a normal, let's set a normal uh, driving, dri driving, 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 uh, normal suspension design, or normal suspension tune. That means the car is uh, comfortable, as you can see, it's, uh, it's sporty, it's drivable, it's perfect, but it understeers a little bit. Check it out. Uh, so how you can how can, how you can tune this is the suspension. Now this is a point. After you are happy with your tire sizes, like we, because we already we already we, have, we already have chosen a, the tire sizes before the suspension. So choose your, your 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 favorite tire size. Go to the suspension. Choose the normal or the sport if you want. But the sport it's less less comfortable. So go with normal because this is a normal car and then start to play with the camber and the sway bars to determine how much understeering and oversteering you want. So for front wheel drive car for regular daily driving you don't need so much you don't you don't, you actually you don't need so much uh, oversteering and also you, you don't need so much understeering so you need to rake, work it perfectly. So the best thing to do is minus one and a half degrees on the front camber, positive half a degree on the rear camber, and start to go with less front, uh, less thick front sway bars. So the car now is starting to oversteer. When you have this line shooting up, that means the car will lose control. That's not good. So what you have to do is drop it to zero, for example, and now let's try again. All right, still oversteers. Okay, if the car still oversteers so much, that means your tire sizes are wrong. So yeah, we are still having the same problem. So what I'm gonna do is leave it like this. Go back to the tires and see how I can actually fix it. No. Yeah. So let's increase the rear tire sizes. Decrease the front ones a little bit. Keep it 200. Now let's go back. Mm -hmm. Now let's put this one. Let's 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 put a thin one. This is too much. Okay, I understand that. 
I don't want to put like 100%. Yeah, I know the idea. Alright, so a little harder springs, okay. Alright, so 90.2, that's actually not bad. Right. Sporty, suspension tune, day driving car. Set it to zero. This way, we will have less tire cost. All right, so let's 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 go with less tire cost because the more camber, the more tire cost you have. So what we have to do here? All right, two or five. All right, two or five, two or five. That means oversteering. Okay, it's not bad. All right, here we go. 0.8. This way, we have a cheap running. It's cheaper than car, not bad. What am I doing? I forgot. Yeah, here we go, here we go. 28, 28, 92.8, okay. Alright, so this is good actually. That means the car will perform very nicely and it, it will have a little understeer, but it will be controllable because people on the street, they don't want, they don't really want to drive on the track, so... So yeah, no. Okay, that's good. Now let's try the let's try and decrease the ride height a little bit, not too much, because we want to put people inside the car, and we don't actually want the car to bottom out. Let's increase the sway bars a little bit, so this way we we'll have. Less roll angle, okay. No, that's not good. Go back a little bit. More stiff dampers, a little bit stiffer dampers. Will work the performance. Alright, here we go. Here we go, here we go. Here we go. Perfect. 93.2. So what we have here says the rear brake force is very high. Okay. Rear brake force is very high. That means we need, we need smaller rear brakes. So 250 will do it. Perfect. So as you can see, the brakes are perfect right now. No warning lights, nothing. Now let's balance the brakes. So how you can balance the brakes? Well, you need to push, scroll up or down, and make sure that these are in the green. Because when they are in the green, like so, that means your brakes are balanced perfectly. Alright, here we go. Now let's decrease the pad type. Yes, like this. For the six, this way it's a little, it's it's more soft. It's not really high, hard. It's not to not squeak, squeak. Yeah, as you can see, medium compound tires are working very very nicely. Bigger rims, no. Bigger tires, no. No, it's perfect this way. It's really, really perfect. Alright, so the tires are done, the brakes are done, the suspension is done. Uh, because uh, the suspension right now, as you can see, because it's it's a normal car, not a racing car. So 93 on the sorkiness, which is extremely high uh, for, for a normal car. And the uh, drivability is 96.3, which is also very, very good for a normal car. Because you need, you need very, very high drivability and really really low sportiness but if you do that if you follow the game rules which is very very low sportiness and 100 percent drivability that would make the car to understeer very very hard i mean really really bad understeer and if you go with super super high sportiness and very very low drivability that means a gentle turn of the steering wheel it will make the car to lose control and crash so also you need to pay attention you need to to find the middle line the silver lining and please make sure the bump area here the bump graph both these lines will overlap i mean yes they are not here working but look at look at this they are overlapping perfect now let's go to the drivetrain or the gearbox and adjust as you can see the customers want more more 
as you can see right less final drive okay so we can give them that if you want to follow the customer rules like if you, if you like this market if you, if you want to sell the car in it you can just pin it and this one also and you can just focus it to make your car to get as high the highest numbers and the highest scores possible and this way you can sell the car so customers want they want actually 227 231 so the customers want that so i'm gonna stick with 231 we have a 1.6 percent wheel spin which is perfect eight seconds from zero to hundred as you can see if you decrease the spacing yes you will have less wheel spin but the car will be much slower as you can see 8.2 seconds so we need to so the silver lining or the best option is to leave it on zero which is eight seconds perfect but if you don't if you don't like that if you want to push it down a little bit like so so let's see 47 this one 27 miles per gallon all right yeah i think i'm gonna leave it like this yeah the car is actually the car is actually surprisingly heavy because i mean one and a half tons because of course you have a corrosion resisting steel chassis so we have a steel chassis and a steel body i mean that, that's why the car is heavy if the car was made from for example aluminium uh, it will get much much lighter than this and the car is big it's not really small look at it it's a four-door five-seater car yes it has a 1.6 liter engine eight seconds it's not really the quickest car here but it works absolutely beautiful so let's see how to perform we have some brake fading so increase this Perfect. let's see how to perform gonna take a long time not, not gonna wait for it so two minute two minutes 36.36 that is actually a very good time it's not bad for it for, for only a 170 horsepower car all right now the markets the market all right so you have to choose what country you want to sell the car in gasmia farinia yes that's farinia not bad archinia these are just the people here don't like these cars this area not bad and you have at, at, at the bottom end Daluha Daluha it's like I don't know I think this is a very very rich country I think it, this is like maybe 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 this is like Dubai or you know the Middle East I think which people they can buy any car you, you can do as you can see 100% they can, they can have 100% of people can afford it so yeah this area is like I think it's, it's like maybe Europe maybe Gaznia, maybe like I don't know actually. I'm trying to make comparisons here, maybe Europe, maybe not. So, because this country here requires 35 points for safety, 27 points for safety, 40 points for safety. Whoa, they want they only like safe cars, and our car is has only has 50 points, which, which is perfect. So, you have to choose what country you want to sell it in. Hmm. Alright, Farinia then. Farinia will do will do just fine. And then you have to increase the how, how much how much margin you want, how much you, how how much more profits you want for over the over the base price of your car. So with 20% margin, this thing will cost 18,812. 30%, 20000 dollars Yeah, that's absolutely correct. 27 miles to the gallon. It's not really the efficient, most efficient car ever. Of course not, because it's heavy. It's one and a half ton of car uh with only 1.6 liter engine up front but it's very reliable uh it's has it's very practical it's very drivable it's sporty it's comfortable has normal prestige point for a normal car it's safe it's very very low on emissions 59 points so it's a clean car and that is absolutely perfect it can go off-road which is surprising it has good utility points has a good environmental resistance 
passenger volume is very good perfect it's an absolute perfect machine i love this car it's a good car for the city all right now let's but we forgot i forgot to mention something this thing has a bad aerodynamics in it because check out the steering here because of the because what we have at the front is a front lip as it, a front fat lip as you can see so we need to adjust that this line here is shooting up which is over steering not good so at high speed this thing will lose control and crash so what you need to do is well it's simple you need to let's see decrease or increase i always forget so yes we need to increase no actually decrease decrease so you need to decrease it's not really working so what we need to do is i think we need to add a rear downforce mod on the car now it's not really working like this because it can oversteer and crash so the, the front fat lip alone it's not enough i mean it, if, if i remove it yes the car will work fine but i don't want to remove it because the car looks beautiful with it so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna add like a rear like a rear beautiful what is it here we go here we go like a really beautiful aerodynamic mode like this like a vent yeah this way i have to change the exhaust pipe it's okay perfect all right let's go back all right it's not much better this way so if we increase all right here we go so as you can see the, the line went down which is worth perfect. All right, here we go. 27.5 points, 27.6, 8. Here we go. This is perfect. 95, 50. All right, here we go. 95, 50. Here we go. All right, now the line is going down. So on high speeds, when the car is starting to go quick, it will not oversteer. It will be it will understeer at high speed which is which is good you know because this is not a track car you want this car to be stable at high speed so this way it's very very stable perfect yeah keep it like this perfect so what's the total weight of the car 1496 all right let's see if this mod actually made the car uh slower or quicker we need to adjust the uh it's facing a little bit. There we go. Eight seconds. Perfect. Again. So let's decrease the hmm, twenty-six point nine miles per gallon. Twenty-seven. So what do I want? Do I want? High fuel efficiency or zero to hundred quick time. I want zero to hundred quick time. That's bad. We need to actually hmm. So I need to choose between top speed. So top speed is two fourteen, okay, so I can so I know. So 219, all right. Hmm, no. So you need to keep adjusting your car. As you can see, it will not work the moment you, you actually you set it off. So you need to sacrifice some time. So I had to sacrifice the little MPG to keep it in eight seconds and to keep it stable on high speed. So. I think we need to choose, yes, I, I think we need to choose the cooling flaps, yes, some customers will not like that because more things can, can actually go wrong and the car will get a little heavier but it will get 27 miles to the gallon, but I think 8.1 seconds, it's not good. Wow, that's not good at all.
Oh, I want some wheel spin. I don't want to kill all the wheel spin. Twenty-seven point nine. Okay, so twenty-seven point nine scorpions. Yes, but this is too much. I don't care about that. I want to keep it eight seconds. I don't want the slow. Uh, I don't want the slow count. So eight seconds, one point seven percent. Perfect. Now let's see. Two, two minute thirty-six thirty-six. Let's see if it will actually get quicker. Ah, you see, the weird, the weird mod made the car quicker around the corners because more, more grip on the rear tires. So, well, two minutes, thirty-five, eighty-four. Wow, that's a big difference. Wow, that's a really, it's like a, it's like a full second difference. Wow, beautiful. Yes, I mean the car has some rough edges. It's not really perfect. I mean, I don't, act I don't actually prefer the rear, the rear tires to be shuffled shoved down as you can see I, mean, I like them to be sticking out and a little extra for the out ah oh, the car terminated obviously okay apologize all right so 20 i think is just perfect let's see yeah much better let's see if this actually did, did effect 35, 25, 24, that is actually quicker. Oh, beautiful. 8.1 seconds. Hmm. So I need to accept the 8.1 seconds. Okay. One last try. All right, so I have to accept that. 8.1 seconds. 215 kilometers per hour quarter mile in 16 all right no brake fading one near, i mean nearly one and a half ton vehicle it can tow one and a half ton 1600 it's, it can get only 26.5 miles to the gallon twenty thousand dollars perfect i love this car so much I, I want to keep working on it and make it better so this is a this is my first ever tutorial video. I, I apologize for the long video. I hope that you learned how to make your first car in automation game. So get creative, make good cars, and tell me what do you think in the comment section. And if you if you if you make a great car, uh, if you make a good car, and if you want to share it with me, if you want to show me your creation, add my Discord. The link in the in the description below. Just press the link. You will get added on my Discord. Uh, group so you can chat with me chat with everyone else and if you want to share your car or your creation on the discord page you can share it over there you can show me what, what what's your result uh, what kind of horsepower what kind of torque what kind of car you are building rear wheel drive front wheel drive 4x4 it's up to you my friend get creative make uh, make whatever you want and uh, a little tip before i close the video if if you are building any car front wheel drive 4x4 uh, rear wheel drive don't go 100% sportiness. If, if if you want to drive it, if you want to drive it in BeamNG.Drive and you don't want your car to crash and oversteer all the time, if you, if, if, if you are not building a drift car, yeah, keep, keep the sportiness like 93% and keep the drivability over 95%. This way, your car will be grippy. It can it can be you can you can drive it nicely if it was rear wheel drive front wheel drive four x four all wheel drive if you keep it this way it will be drivable it will not be hard to drive and the wheel spin if you are building a front wheel drive car like 1.6 1.7 2 it's acceptable very good rear wheel drive the same because with the rear wheel drive you don't you don't want too much wheel spin because you don't want to crash and wrap around the tree. So 2%, 2.5% on rear-wheel drive works absolutely beautiful. And let's see what else. Uh, All-wheel all drive, well, with all-wheel drive, you, you can go 5 6%. Because all-wheel drive, you will have mechanical grip. You'll have so much grip with all-wheel drive, so you can go 6%. 4x4, four four, uh, no, keep it yeah, like 6 7%, like 8% max. Because, uh, yeah, you don't want to over to crash or you know, to, to keep the wheels spinning. Yeah, and enjoy your time. Don't choose any wrong parts. Like for example, if you are building a street car, don't choose manual locker. I mean, keep everything in its own category, and uh, think and plan your car before you do it. 
I mean, make make. I want to see great creations. So surprise me on Discord with your amazing creations, and um, I'm I'm gonna see you very very soon. So thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. I hope that you learned something from this video. So I hope and I apologize for making it too long, but it, it requires some explaining. So thank you so much for watching. If you want me to do another tutorial video like on rear wheel drive car or all wheel drive car, I will be more than happy. Tell me in the comment section below if you wanted me to do that. So thank you so much. Don't forget to hit that like button, watch my previous videos, and if you like my work, get subscribed and share the video if you want to share it. And if you really like my channel and if you want to support the channel, the, the link in the, in the description below for my Patreon page. You can sign up to my Patreon page, download special cars, get 4K wallpapers, and get a, and get a, th a special thank you note from me on my on my next video. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. So thank you so much guys for watching. Have a great morning, evening, afternoon, whatever time you are watching this video. And of course, get creative and watch my previous videos and tell me what you think always in the comment section below. So thank you so much and goodbye for now, my friends.